This chart over here is not an altcoin chart. This is the chart of the NASDAQ as plotted against Bitcoin. And what it shows is it shows the performance of NASDAQ against Bitcoin from November 2011. And if you follow this chart, you'll see that against Bitcoin, the NASDAQ is down 99.98% since 2011. And it's not unique to this chart. In fact, even if you plot the, the performance of the biggest store of value in the world, gold, against Bitcoin, the chart kind of looks exactly the same. In fact, even worse, if you take gold from this point over here in 2012 and you plot it against Bitcoin, you'll see that gold is down 99.9999999%. What we are witnessing here is we are witnessing the biggest macro trade of our lifetimes. And if you play this macro trade right, you'll realize that not only is there no other trade that makes sense, but you realize that if you mess this up, you're probably an absolute, absolute idiot. So today I've got a really, really, really rare treat for you guys. We're gonna be talking about the biggest macro trade of our lifetimes. And we're gonna be talking about how not to mess this up. Because really, your only job is don't fuck this up. That's it. All right, so let's do it, guys. Big, big, big show today. I've got Raul Paul, I've got Dan Tapiero here. It's gonna be a massive banger, banger, banger show. Let's go, guys. Imagine if someone said to you, listen, you're going to make 99.999, every other index in the world is going to devalue 99.9997% against this one asset. And really, the only job that you have to do is not to mess this up. And to make things even more fun, now that the TradFi guys have an ETF, this acceleration that you saw not only in gold, but also in the NASDAQ is actually just about to get even worse, which means that if we look at this chart going a couple of years forward, it's gonna be much, much, much steeper because now TradFi is getting in the game. You really only have one job, really. In fact, you have two jobs. Number one, don't mess up the trades. And number two, don't get hacked. Because if you get hacked and you lose all your money when you've got this opportunity, it's gonna be the saddest thing in the world. So in order for you guys not to get hacked, I always recommend that you need to get a VPN. And the reason why you need to get a VPN is multiple fold. The first thing is, remember, you want to be surfing anonymously. You don't want hackers to know where you're surfing from. You don't want hackers with a honey pot, a honey pot into your laptop. And the way to do that is to mask your IP address. You can see right now, because I'm on the office laptop, I'm not surfing with, with, a, with a VPN. And so it knows exactly where I am. And it's literally telling hackers where they can get my IP address. Now you can protect yourself by getting NordVPN. All you do, you cl click this button over here, you pay less than $3 a month to, to save all this cash. Don't be the person who loses all their money and then tries to get a VPN because they never want to do it again. You're doing it in advance. Now listen, there is a link below the video, as you can see. There, in fact, there are three links. This is the basic VPN. This is what you call threat protection. And if you're in crypto and you don't have threat protection, you're crazy because this blocks all the fake malicious sites that where you could potentially connect your wallet to and get all your funds drained. Guys, I say this again, you only have one job. Your job is not to mess this up. Don't get caught out on a stupid hack or something like that. Pay the $6 a month, get yourself NordVPN, get yourself Threat Protect, and, and make sure that you don't fail on the basics. Now listen, I'm gonna wait for you guys to do it because I know it takes a little bit of time. Just go to the link below. I'm waiting, just click here, open the NordVPN, sign it up. And then we can get the show on the road. Let's get the show on the road. NordVPN are our sponsor. They are one of the best sponsors. By supporting them, you protect your crypto and you support the channel so we can bring you more of these amazing Friday banters. And today is an absolutely, absolutely, absolutely amazing Friday banter on a day when Bitcoin is absolutely exploding. So as I was saying, I have uh, today I've got a very special treat for you guys. I've got our friends, Ral Paul, a friend of mine who I haven't spoken to for a long time. In fact, I haven't spoken to him since the beginning of the bull market or the ETF part of the bull market. And we've also got Dan Tapiero. And really what they're gonna be doing here today is they're going to be telling you why this is the biggest macro trade of your lifetime and basically showing you how not to mess this up. So listen guys, before we get into the show, if you're not already subscribed to our channel, subscribe to our channel. We are the fastest growing crypto community in the world. We are also the tightest crypto community in the world. Also, if you are a regular and if you're here right now, smash the like button, obliterate the like button. Um, that tells the YouTube algorithm that we're giving you guys good content and that uh, circulates the show around the world. So help us 
and we will carry on bringing you the highest alpha per minute shows in the world. So as I said, I haven't spoken to Raul for a long time. And I'm really keen to get his views on the success of the ETF and everything surrounding it. So I think without further ado, let's go, guys. Raul, Dan, how are you? Great, thank you. Always good to... This combination of three people is always fun. It's, it's going to be fun, and especially with the market doing what it's doing and with the ETFs doing what they're doing. It's going to be a crazy, crazy, crazy one. Dan, good to see you. Good to see you in, in, these, in these great conditions. Yeah, happy to be here. Uh, if you're not happy now, then I don't know what's going to make you happy. Uh, so yeah, no, happy to be here. All right, so let's let's I mean let's get to, let's get straight to it. The ETFs. Uh, we haven't spoken since the ETFs launched. Right, I think we spoke before the ETFs launched, and we spoke about three to six months. Three months later, we said if there's anything near five billion dollars, I think this would have been an astounding success. Uh, I looked at the numbers earlier. It looks crazy. I mean, the BlackRock ETF broke ten billion in in less than in seven weeks. The this this the bleed outside of the the bleed outside of the GBTC has been has pretty much subsided. We're doing days with on on days we're getting six and seven hundred million dollars of ETF inflows. I mean, were you guys as surprised as I was to see this happening? Yeah, this is bananas. This is the most successful ETF launch of all time. I mean, we've we've never seen anything anything like this, and it's it's only really just started. I don't know, Dan. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, look, in one day, we onboarded essentially $100 trillion, right? If you think about all of the people globally who have stock accounts, right? How much value is held in all of those accounts globally? Not just Americans who love to own assets via equity and ETF form, but just think about it. people in Asia, people in Europe, who have equity accounts, all of those traders on the interactive broker platform now can just push a button and they own uh, Bitcoin. So I think, you know, it's just like uh, Coinbase in one day um, onboarding that kind of value. So I think, um, you know, I knew it would be bullish. I didn't have any like specific idea about it. I just thought it makes it really easy um, for people to own. And I have a lot of investors in my fund who maybe are a little older. And I've had a few of them tell me over the last two years or so, I would say, oh, did you get your Bitcoin? You know, now's a good time, 20,000, 25,000, 30,000. Uh, you know, buy a little Ethereum, 1,800, 2,000. Uh, they're like, no, 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 we're just going to wait for the ETF, okay? So I, I have a lot of, I always have a lot of um, actual first-hand uh, uh, data, right? So I, I, I was pretty confident, and the guys who are saying this to me are very sophisticated old-world investors. I mean, Raul, you would know a few of these guys that have said to me, oh, I'm just going to wait for the ETF, Uh and so and now the ETF, I mean, look, now yeah. the ETFs here, now the ETFs here um, and they've started buying and they've bought 10, 15 billion dollars worth worth of Bitcoin. How far into the buying cycle do you think we are? Like, do you think that there was like a frenzy to get in in the beginning? What do you mean? It's not even the beginning of the beginning. I mean, I just you have trillions of dollars that now have a one button push. Yeah, there's eight. There's yeah. eight right. trillion in these RAAs. That's all that's happening really right now is RAAs. Now, you've got to understand how these RAAs work, and Dan knows them because there's a whole bunch of investors in his fund. Is These guys are networks. They're not like brokers get on the phone like buy, buy, sell. They go and have a steak dinner with their best client who talks about this Bitcoin ETF. They're like, I'm not sure. They read Barron's that week. They're like, I'm not sure if it's the right thing to do. They then go and play golf. Their other client talks about it, and eventually... You know, they're, they're this huge property developer from Cincinnati then sticks in, you know, five million bucks into the ETF. This is the process. So it's actually really slow. And we've only just started. And a lot of these people are driven by price. That's what you, you know, said. If you look at NVIDIA, you see how price feeds on itself. It becomes reflexive. So we've just started. So that's, that's what you tweeted the other day. And I read this tweet. You said the reflexivity of launch Bitcoin ETF number go up, more buying of ETF number go up, more buying of ETF number go up, more buying of ETF. And it's just, as you said, it's like something, it's like something to behold. I mean, do these people, do these guys not think like 
retail investors where they say, hold on, the number's gone up, let me wait for a pullback. Is that, is that not how these guys operate? No, because no, the, these guys are not traders in the whole. These RAA networks generally talk to their clients about, you should think about an X percent allocation. They put an X percent allocation or they mandate it and say, hey, we're going to do this for you guys. They do it. And then what happens is Dan and I have seen this all the way through with friends of ours. They start with 1%. And then before you know it, they get up to 5%. And they're like, fuck it, we're going to 10% because they start to understand the power of this thing. So it becomes very reflexive in price action. Um, you know, I've seen family offices. I've got um, one of the investors in, in my fund is a big Australian family office. At first, their allocation was 1%. I think at they probably got up to 20% in crypto allocations in the end because, you know, once the principal started to under, understand it, that it, it just keeps building on, on itself and the price action just builds on it. So we've, as Dan said, we're really, really early still. So you're surprised? Well, also, with, you know, I would ahead, also Dan. just Go. say that, you know, many people, I would say that also many people, you know, will do a dollar cost average. So this is, Someone will say, okay, I'm going to 3% and they do a half a percent every quarter for the next you know, few quarters. So I think there are a lot of people who purchase things like that. No one is, I mean, no, no, very few people just come in and say, okay, put 5 million in. It's an all time high. I don't care. A lot of those guys will do, you know, so I think that you have to expect that there's a tail to many of these purchases that Raul's talking about. And, and then there's also these massive platform models like BlackRock, Fidelity, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, that suddenly add it to their asset allocation mix. And those guys control like a trillion dollars of assets. So once they do it, it's the same process. It then starts dollar cost averaging in. And you know we've seen BlackRock talking about doing that. I don't think it's even started yet. So those massive pools of capital start coming in as well. And we're not talking institutions. None of the institutions are in yet, really. So, okay. So you, you say that the buying pressure, you're saying that the buying pressure is actually just starting. And from the, the way that you guys are describing it, it's, it's not about, it's about to actually get more aggressive as time goes on because there's going to be more buyers and they're going to be increasing much more of the allocation. Yeah. Also, don't forget, the 401k bid in America is another big thing. One of the reasons passive funds have outperformed active portfolios, like the NASDAQ and the S&P keeps outperforming, is because millennials, every two weeks, add to their 401k of this stuff. They can now add Bitcoin into their 401ks. So that becomes a every two-week bid that goes in perpetuity forever. Now, it doesn't mean it can't go up and down you know, with the business cycle, but it's it's a very big structural change that people don't really understand. Okay. And I mean, let's put the ETF aside for one second and just talk about the price. So now that the ETF's launched and we look at the price, I mean, the price has had, we've had incredible price action. I think we, we can't deny that. If we, I mean, I'm going to take us back a couple of weeks and just kind of like look at, look at the price action from, let's say, I don't know, in the last year. I mean, we, we've, we've gone up in the, in the last year, uh, about 300%. And I think since the ETF, the, the ETF action started, which was somewhere around June or July, let's just go here, we're up about 165%. Are you surprised? I mean, if I were to say to you that when the ETFs approved one month and one week after the ETFs approved, we would be at 67,000, we'd be tapping the all-time highs. Is that surprising to you at all? Or is, I mean, is this what you guys expected? Well, I've been calling for, you know, since... Q1. I mean, since Q4 22, I thought the low was in. I was pretty loud about it on Twitter and at conferences. And, you know, the first half of 23, uh, it was, I was super bullish. And, uh, you know, so I, I think that this is one of many very bullish factors. So, um, you know, we, we haven't even had the having yet, right? That's another thing. We haven't even had a supportive macro backdrop yet. So the Fed hasn't even cut yet. And, you know, it, what you what you could have said to me was, if the Fed funds rate is at 5%, do you think Bitcoin will be at 70,000? I, I would have thought, well, 
you know, it probably needs to wait a little bit, right? The Bitcoin price could wait a little bit for some, for some Fed action. So there's no waiting because the market knows that inflation is slowing. Um, and the Fed is just lagging that cycle. And, you know, that's what I would say for me as a macro guy, that's what's a little surprising. Not that we're here, um, but one of the main drivers hasn't even kicked in yet. So, I mean, I'm looking uh, at... We, we could also talk about the Ethereum ETF, which I think is definitely going to happen. And that hasn't even kicked in yet. Um, I mean, there are a lot of bullish fundamental things out there. I mean, let's talk about the, the Fed funds rate. I mean, so with the, uh, Ryan Stalker tweeted, he said the last time Bitcoin was as high, the Fed's fund rate was at 0 0.08. Today, it's at 5.33. Um, I mean, that's what the chart looks like. We know that... We yeah, know I mean, that you're, look, you've got to understand that a 5% interest rate is not a hurdle to an asset that goes up 100% a year on average, right? It's just, it's irrelevant. But liquidity drives assets. So liquidity did pick up, but as Dan's rightly said, the game has only just started in the liquidity cycle. At the end of this, I mean, the Chinese are in the middle of pretty much a debt deflation. They're going to print money, serious amounts of it. The Fed are going to cut. The Europeans are going to cut. The Fed are probably going to end up bailing out a few banks. You know, the whole game is to be played. We've got an election to bribe voters with. There's usually... Straight after the election, there's usually a fiscal stimulus. Let's say Trump gets in, he'll probably do a stimulus. You know, there is money to be handed out all over the place. So what is surprising is, yeah, we had a very strong run even before the halving. It's early in the macro season, but it is what it is. You know, it's I, does it does it mean that we're going to have a really big run this cycle? I, I don't know yet. Well, wait a second. Hold on. Hold on. I think this is actually a little more straightforward. You know, when you break the high, you then 3x. You know, when we broke the, the 2017 peak was 20,000. We broke that. Then we went to 60 ish. OK, so that's 3x. We probably now we're going to break the, the high at 60, uh, whatever, seven. And I think we can legitimately 3x again. That's 190 or so. That seems to me to be like a fairly, you know, reasonable over the next 12 to 24 months. I, the, the timing always is a little tough. Uh, direction is not as tough. Uh, volatility, insane volatility is a known. Um, but the ultimate direction we know, I, I really do feel but that. And, you know, with, a, with an asset class now that's only a few trillion dollars in total, it's like three and a half trillion. I think if you add up all the cryptocurrencies and all of the equity of the companies in the space, it's like three and a half trillion. So it's still very small. Um, so I, I think easily one, you know, 180, 190. Um, and, and on an, a super extension, you could probably do 250 to 300. That was my original target in the middle of 2019 when I did my very first talk about this with Raul. I thought that we could go, you know, up to 350,000. That was over a 10 year period. So it was 19 to 29. So I don't think it's that, that I think that's sort of baked in a little bit. You can look at it another way. I'll stop talking in a second, but you can look at it another way from the low of 3000 on Bitcoin in 2018, Q418, you did 20 X. Okay. From the low three, 3000 to uh, 60,000 and below this time, Bitcoin call it, you know, 15,000, a 20 X would be, um, 300. 300 so I think somewhere between, you know, 190 and 300, like that's not a crazy. Okay. I but, think, uh, crazy but new, yeah, but let, let's just talk about the cycle. So a lot of people are talking about this left translated cycle and they're talking about it because, Bitcoin's never been followed this pattern where we've broken out so early before the halving, with the halving's 40, 45 days away. And there's a lot of talk about uh, the left translated cycle. And, the, and you know, and they kind of said, one theory that I've seen is that 
people are saying that the ETF actually replaced the halving in terms of an event. And we're about to maybe get a second event. So we kind of had two events this year. One is the reduce, re, re, reduction of supply. And one is the, 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 the uh, propulsion of the demand, so to speak. So you've got the, the ETF on the one side and the halving on the other side. And some people are saying that as a result of this, we may get a left translated cycle, which means that the cycle will end sooner as well. How do you feel well, about, about it's whether, whether it's going to be a long cycle or not a long cycle? Cycle to me is driven by the macro. That macro cycle has been the three and a half year, four year cycle, and it's the same cycle in all assets. So I don't see any reason the cycle would change unless we create some sort of weird monster bubble in crypto or we just got a very strong cycle on our hands. Some cycles are stronger than others. And the last cycle, I thought cut short. I thought there should have been a next leg higher. I thought it should have got to 100, and it didn't. And I think people have PTSD from that. Um, and so I think they're fearful of screwing it up again and getting too bullish. And I actually think I've always – there's actually more of a – fear of something like 2013 where it kind of had a dip everyone thinks it's over and then it it it, it went up like another 4x or something stupid i think the bubble cycles actually maybe a higher probability now than this left translation when i talk to people about the left translated when you ask them it's just ptsd so the left translated cycle it, you, you're the second person who said it's a ptsd thing and it's a crypto thing and then we are going to continue to follow the the, the macro cycle how long is this macro cycle going to last in your view? Give me your views well, on, on, on the macro from cycle. The everything, from the everything code work that I've done that I've talked extensively about, it should be normally it's right towards the very end of 2025. Now, could it be a little bit earlier? You know, but normally the crypto cycle ends in November, December every time. That's, that's, that's We're talking about 500 days after the halving, which is end of 2025. That's that, Those are the numbers. Dan, how do you feel about the, the, the cycle? How do you feel about the length of the cycle? Is it a left translated cycle or is it just an aggressive cycle that started yeah. a little bit early? Well, I'm more interested in, in price than time. So, I mean, it just might, the target are, is, are those prices I mentioned. And so it can happen, you know, a year from now, two years from now. I, I don't know. It's within this 12 to 24 month period. Um, now that so I, 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 know, I mean, look, markets never do exactly the same thing. They rhyme, right? So price action, you know, is similar. So I, I'm not surprised. And, and you know, if you just step away and say it's a slightly more aggressive start than we've had, why? Because we an aggressively more amount of capital has access to the space. So it kind of makes sense. At a very top level, more people have access to it, goes up more. Fine. If you think that that we're now going to start following, well, that we are following a macro cycle, and you also add to that the fact that we've got the Bitcoin ETF now. We will talk about the ETF, uh, the ETH ETF in a couple of secs. But does that mean that our corrections are going to start following stock market corrections? And when I say corrections are going to start following stock market corrections, Previous crypto bear markets have been brutal. Some of them have been a year and a half. Some of them have been two years. Um, they've been really, really, really uh, brutal. Do you think now that we've got Bitcoin as an institutional asset and lots of money coming in, do you think that the macro is going to dictate the crypto bear markets as well? So do you feel that? I've, I've, talked, I've talked extensively on your show about this. They are the same cycle. They always have been. They're I just mean, crypto is a forward looking asset. They're the same asset. So I, I don't see any different. I mean, everything went down in 2022 and crypto bottomed earlier and, 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 and led and then NASDAQ followed. So I don't see any real difference here whatsoever. It's a more volatile asset for sure because it's a more forward looking asset. So more volatile means right, that the dips will be second. bigger. One second. But the one thing to remember is that, yeah, there's a correlation, but over the last 10 years, even the NASDAQ is down 99% against Bitcoin. Hmm. So the S&P is down 99%. Every asset in the world versus Bitcoin is down 99%. So there's a correlation, but over a longer holding period, 
there is clearly a devaluation of all fiat based assets against Bitcoin and digital assets. And so that is the, the same thing is happening against Ethereum. All those assets, NASDAQ is down 99% in the last 10 years against Ethereum. Ethereum was a penny, it's now 3,800. Uh, you know, if you own NASDAQ instead of Ethereum over that period, you lost a huge amount of money. I so, mean, there's, there's the chart over there. I've just, I've just plotted the chart for, for people who are watching this. This is the chart of the QQQ, which is the NASDAQ ETF, plotted against the Bitcoin price against USD. And if you draw the line over here, you can see that indeed we are, actually we're 99.97% down in the last course. 10 years. 99.97. So people are like, correlation, correlation. I get this asked this by investors and, you know, they just, they just don't get it. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's a really good point, Dan. It's like it might go up and down a little bit the same, but over any period of time, right. it's ludicrous to own any other. I mean, I got to the point where just there's no point owning any other asset. It's just pointless. I agree. I and I don't, except for gold. So yeah, only because you built only because you built a gold which business, is, which is doing great. And I know it's gone down ninety nine percent as well. But I, I I've been a, a holder for a very very long time. So, okay, so I'm, I'm actually uh, plotting the gold chart, but while I'm plotting the gold chart here, let's talk about gold. So gold's now at all-time highs. To, as we're looking at it on the screen, it's $2,157. It's it is just breaking out right now. Bro was like, why are we talking about gold? It's just boring. It's just going to do it's less. so than... boring, Dan. I'm just like, see, so wait, you know, so Dan's, so got, Dan's got like two years on me, so he's just kind of a bit of a boomer when it comes to it. He still has this love oh of gold God. given the chart. So is this a real thing? Is, is this a real thing? Is this a real thing? Is this, uh, do you think that this chart here, which shows the inflows into Bitcoin and the outflows out of gold, is it coincidental that, pe that money's flowing out of gold ETFs and money's flowing into Bitcoin ETFs? Or is it a, is it a proactive switch by fund managers saying there is a new gold, let's take 1% of our previous gold allocation and put it into new gold? Yeah, ask Dan, he cares about gold. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. Maybe gold has just broken out out of a multi-year range and is heading up to 2,500. I think what I still believe gold is the single best hedge, if you want to call it, for the traditional world. But it's also it, there's a lot of information. All the central banks have been buying. That's really what's been driving the gold. Um, and if you look at it. Uh, you know, it's probably heading now to 2,500. Um, it's there's a lot of information in gold price moves because it often doesn't move, but then when it moves, there's a reason. And I, I think it's probably just anticipating a little bit of Raul's liquidity cycle. It's probably being driven actually by the Chinese buying. Um, and then, you know, I, I think Europe, Raul, I don't know if you're aware of this, but both the UK and Germany had negative quarters of GDP in Q3 and Q4. So they were back-to-back -back negative Q over Q seasonally adjusted annualized rates, which of course is the formal definition of a recession. So Germany and the UK have already printed those numbers. You should ask the guy that. And you're you also that. seeing, you're also so seeing, again. you're also seeing inflation imploding in Europe. I mean, hilariously, I mean, PPI numbers in some countries were down negative 20%. And now the CPIs are coming as well. So, yeah, I think you're right. They're going to cut hard. So they're going to cut hard. That's going to increase. So I would just say that gold, I would just say that gold tells you that, um, that it's such a momentous breakout that um, Bitcoin is going to, I mean, it, it is, you should be comfortable with your longs. If you weren't comfortable already, I mean, this is just another TradFi indicator. Do the TradFi guys. Do the Sorry to catch you off again. No, go ahead. I'm go ahead, Dan. Sorry to cut you off. But, you know, I think it is also connected to the implosion in the smaller banks in the U.S. Uh, gold historically uh, has really had a very strong correlation with uh, it used to be the BKX. But I think the 4,000 banks that exist in the U.S. versus sort of 50 in most normal countries, those all those small community banks, regional banks, 
um, they all got crushed by this bond move. And I, I just don't, I don't know what the need and purposes of all those banks. Kathy Wood, I think very smartly sort of five years ago said, in 10 years, there'll be no US banking system. And I, or the banks, the number of banks will decline 90% or something like that, she said. And I thought, wow, I, not even I think that. I don't know that she was thinking that a bond meltdown would drive the collapse of those banks. But just the more those banks go down, the more bullish it is for gold and Bitcoin. And what I think is the beginning of a dollar bear market. Wow. So dollar bear market, b banks collapsing. I mean, we are seeing warning signs. There was the bank that well, there was the bank in New York. The, the name is case. Is it New York Bank that, that or one of the banks that in New York? New York that, Community Bank. New York Community Bank. And that I, I think was bailed out uh, this week with a billion dollar bailout. Do you think that's the first crack? Do you think that's the first the, the no, canary I mean, in the coal mine? St step back. I mean, I even started in this crypto journey back in 2012, 13. Because of this whole process, it happened in Europe. And it's been a rolling process. An excess leverage society will end up destroying all of its banks. So this has been an ongoing thing. So it's not going to stop until they all disappear and you end up with some sort of nationalized banking system. You know, half the European banks are still insolvent, technically, you know. They're just being propped up by the ECB because you can't lose Deutsche Bank because it's the largest bank in Germany. Let me throw something at you guys because you guys talk to TradFi guys all the time. If the banks do start to collapse and we start getting, I don't know, Fed bailouts, no Fed bailouts, no Treasury bailouts, no Treasury bailouts, is that a real reason for people to move into Bitcoin? And I mean, when I say that, will the, will people really move their money out of the banking system into 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 other assets, into into gold, I'm sure they will, because I think that's the traditional safe well, that's haven. Why, it? That's, why I got, that's why I got into crypto. That's why I bought Bitcoin in the beginning, for exactly this. And so, yes, over time, people will realize that self-custody of your own money is a better thing than holding in a banking system. But that's not, that's not the ETF, though. When you say that's not people, uh, you're not saying people are going to withdraw their money out of the bank and go and buy a BlackRock uh, IBIT ETF. It's a combination of both, right? If they understand that it helps the Bitcoin price rise, they'll buy Bitcoin, much like they'll buy the gold ETF. But many people, much like they do with gold, buy physical gold or buy physical Bitcoin as well. Wow, sure. I mean, this sounds like I'm trying not to get too excited, but I, I don't know if it's because I've got PTSD from the previous runs and I'm just trying to contain myself so that I don't, I don't go all in on 100x leverage. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> That's, you're painting, you're well, painting. you shouldn't do that anyway. Like this is, you know, look, I think the greed gets punished by this market. I love these crypto markets. They're free markets. They trade incredibly. Uh, there's no government intervention. And greed just gets punished. So I, I don't care, you know, these 26-year-old guys, they make a thousand X and then, you know, and then they, they, they go crazy. So don't, don't go hundred X. Don't go crazy. Just tell me allocation and tell me how people and, and just tell me how people play the cycle yeah. and, and how people lose in the cycle and how they should play the cycle. Cause I'm sure there's a lot of people here that have just made hundred X's and thousand X's on dog you, with hat. You use leverage, you use leverage ran. I think it's wrong. I just think it's wrong. I've you made plenty of money, as Dan has made plenty of money. I've never leveraged in this market. Have you ever used leverage, Dan? No, it's insane. It's insane. You, you know, I need to. With respect, with respect, so just, I mean, just to, just to put into perspective, 99% of my portfolio is completely unleveraged and in long-term holds that I don't even touch, which sit at, at fancy custodians and whatever else. And with small money in leverage, I've managed to do quite big things. And to be honest, this is the first cycle that I'm actually playing with leverage uh, th towards the end of the last cycle in this cycle. And I've done things with leverage that I wouldn't, I wouldn't ordinarily be able to do. I mean, this is an account that I started. Who cares? You can do that with 1%. Who cares? Yeah, exactly. And that's what I've done here. This, yeah. is one, this was 1% of the. It yeah. doesn't matter. You can you know, go have fun and you know, leverage up and buy Doge and do whatever. I, like, I, I think... I think that's fine, but 
you know, it's just yeah, a yeah, it does. Yeah, it, it is a distraction. It, it, look, it's 1% of the portfolio, which is just because the markets have been running so well, it's it's just been a lot more fun and it's exploded. And, you know, when $50,000 turns into $4 million, it starts to become a little bit a little bit more more serious money. Um, let's talk about alts. Raul, you tweeted something which was, which was I loved it. You said something like, uh, no, wait, I've got to find this tweet. It was something about... Uh, Put your, leave your brains behind kind of thing. Yeah, it says my timeline has gone from mid-curve debates about what is a superior blockchain technology to fuck it, it's a dog with a hat. Welcome to alties and leave your brain behind and enjoy, but the same rules apply. Your DJ bag should not be your main bag. Don't fuck this up. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 you make it sound like it's, it's up only. Uh, leave your brain at the door. Just buy anything. Everything's going to go up. And again, with a small DJ bag, as you talked about, Yes. Have fun. It is a hilarious market. I've never had so much fun in my life as you can have in crypto. So just enjoy it. It's clearly fucking ridiculous that we're buying a token called Dog with Hat. And people are making literally tens of millions of dollars. And it's and these are smart people. Don't joke and they're about doing this. Don't, don't don't joke about dog with hat. Dog with hat has now I own it. I own it. Now three I own times it. larger than Spirit Airlines. The market cap of dog with hat, with hat, is three times larger than Spirit Airlines. No good. No jokes. I, I kid you not. I own it. So I, I'm I'm with it. But you know, it's it's fun. It's fun. It's nice to have financial markets that are fun. People don't take it seriously. You know, D Dan and I came out of markets where people wore suit and ties and took themselves seriously. And here we've got grins on our faces. It's hilarious. It's hilarious that stupid people who know better do stupid stuff. It's lovely. OK, but, but OK, but but surely you can't in, in good conscience tell me that people should be buying a dog with hat at a market cap of one point eight billion dollars. I mean, just. It doesn't matter. It's just one percent, as you said, or do ten percent. Yes, it's things. for you. you it's one percent. For you, it's one percent. Right? For Raul, it's, for, for you, it's one percent. For Raul, it's one percent. But to some of the people watching this, it's eighty percent, and they but have that's wrong. But that's what "don't fuck this up" means. Just don't do right, that. That's too much. Yeah. Just don't do that. You know, the maximum you should be doing in all of the stupid shit is ten percent. And then have fun. Go and do what you want. If you want to use leverage, fine. But just in 10%. Because so the rest walk, of your portfolio will do well. Walk, walk me through the rest of your portfolio. So, I mean, Raul, walk me through like how your portfolio is currently positioned. Given that we're in the early stages of a bull market, walk me through how the 90 So the 10% you've said is in dogs with hats, uh, cats with fleas, uh, frogs with warts, whatever it is. Um, what's the other nine, what does the other 90% look like? The other 90% is basically mainly Solana and hedge funds. Solana and hedge funds. So you're not, not long Bitcoin, not long Ethereum anymore. You were, you were a huge ETH bull. You, you were... No, I put most of my Ethereum... Um, I own a bunch of NFTs. I've been buying some high-end art in NFTs. Um, but really, I put most of my Ethereum, just put it into the fund, the asset management fund I've got. So, um, so that allocates it to... Hedge funds, whose job it is to select all the right tokens. Um, Solana. I'm also on the SUI Foundation, so I have some SUI oh. as well. <laughs> okay, that, that's an interesting story. How did you get onto the SUI Foundation? Um, it was part of the, you know, I wanted to cover this whole crypto bet in a number of different ways. Um, because, I, you know, there's a lot of opportunities here, and I also wanted to see it and experience it all. And one of the things I want to do is go on one of the journeys of one of the large layer ones. But you have to be very careful of who you want to be part of. But this is a very serious group that's come out of, um, you know, they're Facebook. Amazing. It's a, they're amazing. They're, so, they're amazing technologists. So, like, so I got um, <clears throat> I got actually asked by one of the, um, probably the best lawyer in the all of crypto, who said, listen, you should consider this. Um, and so... Yeah, so I've been on that journey. It's been super interesting. I don't talk about it a lot, obviously, because you get this problem of conflict of interest and shilling and all of that stuff. But it's very interesting, super high quality people, uh, an amazing project. So uh, have you not moved down the risk curve? Because I remember when we spoke in the last cycle, you were Bitcoin, Ethereum, and you kind of started moving down the risk curve um, yourself. No, Sol is like ETH of the last cycle. And are you... Have and you... My further out the risk curve currently is the hedge funds, because... We're kind of max risk right now because it's alt season. 
Dan, what what is your what was your what would your uh, play be in the cycle? I just, have, um, I just have Bitcoin and ETH as longtime holdings, and uh, and then I have a significant allocation to my funds, and those funds own twenty four of uh, the businesses in the space. Um, you know, from you know largest investment being Ledger and then Animoca and then uh, Deribit and then Kraken. And then we have investments in, you know, all sorts of other Gemini, but Quicknode, Futureverse, um, you know, Bitfury, uh, you know, um, uh, Nova Labs. Pretty much, pretty much invested. Pretty much invested in all the in all the giants of of of, of the cycle. Um, well, the, the guys making money, um, you know, the guys with businesses, Figment, Leaden, um, so, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Circle. Let's talk a little yes. bit about let's talk a little bit about the ETH ETF. Um, there there are conflicting views. Uh, some people think it's a slam dunk and it has to be approved in May. Otherwise, the, the, because there's an ETH futures ETF, otherwise the court's going to call Gary uh, arbitrary and capricious again. Others are saying, no, it's, it's at least a year away. The SEC hasn't even started engaging with these, with these issuers. Do you have any views on, on whether or not we're going to get the ETF? From the same people I spoke to about the Bitcoin ETF, who are the ETF providers, yeah, they think it's all going to go through. Probably, you know, it'll get de- whether it gets delayed once or twice, but I think pretty much everybody thinks it'll go through. Dan, are you hearing anything different? No, it's the same. It doesn't, but if you look, is it next month? Is it three months? Uh, who cares? It's happening. But and the ETH, ETF is really interesting because there's a dynamic here, which is the more activity, the more ETH gets burnt. 28% of ETH is staked. That's a real problem. It's going to get a little bit unruly in ETH. And I think you know that's that's a very interesting dynamic that we have not seen. It's more significant than the halving in many ways, and that could really ignite this market. Now, that's there'll be less demand for an ETH ETF, obviously, than there is for a Bitcoin ETF. It's a different beast. Are they competitors? Are they competitive? So when, when an ETH ETF launches, is it like asset managers now deciding... Do they treat Bitcoin as a store of value and ETH as a transaction network and put them into two separate buckets? Or- I think they think of ETH, ETH generally as a technology and Bitcoin as a store of value. So th- I think they think of them differently. Um, you know, I don't think the ETF will have a yield yet, but you know, a technology with a yield is highly attractive at some point. So a lot of asset managers will like that a lot. It's easier to get through an investment committee than we've got this new store of value thing. So look, it, it'll do well over time. Um, so I don't think it competes. Somebody raised a good point. I think it was Eric Baltunas, the guy from um, Bloomberg. From Bloomberg. Who's been, um, he just said, listen, one of the most important things is people will package these two things together and create a, an ETF of the space. It's like that's probably what drives the most volume. I think that's probably right. I'm busy looking for a trade. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm busy looking two, for a- Those are the two core assets. Sorry, Dan? Those are the two core assets of the space. So they've achieved network effect already. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to find this uh, tweet from Fred Kruger. I'm sure, you've, I'm sure you've been following him. He's, uh, he's, a, he's, he's a real there's Bitcoin- always one that, There's always one in every cycle. What's wrong with these people? They always come up to trying to attack me as well. I don't know. For what reason? I don't even know the guy. <laughs> and he's like tweeting again. I'm like, really? Yeah. So he, he he says that the worst thing that could happen is, hey, here it is. Yeah, I'm gonna. I've, I've got. I managed to find the tweet. He says, my one concern in life. He said, this is his one concern in life. It is critical that we keep the Wall Street spigot 100% focused on Bitcoin for at least one year. If they accept the ETH ETF in 2025, it'll be too late. Wall Street will already uh, put committed on Bitcoin. If by some horror. The ETH ETF passes this year. Rail pol- uh, the rail piles of this world will continue to convince a fair amount of people to go to ETH instead. The narrative will shift from to, to Bitcoin versus ETH. It'll be confusing. Bitcoin will still win, but it'll slow things down. So he's the plan B. Fred Kruger is the plan B of the cycle. We had, we had plan B last cycle, and now we have Fred Kruger this cycle. But I mean, I, for me, Max Kaiser. 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been in Max Kaiser's in Max Kaiser's uh, sites for a while. But I mean, so for Wall Street, is are Bitcoin and ETH crypto, or is Bitcoin a, a digital gold and ETH a transactional network? One is a technology and one is a store of value, or is that not how it works? That's not how it works. They're both crypto. They'll be allocated to in some proportion, you know, either 50-50 or 80-20 or whatever they feel Market like. Market cap weighted. Or whatever. But it's those are the two core assets at the moment. Five years from now, there could be more. I don't know. We, so you know, from Raul, so Solana is transitioning, I think, from a venture project, which is what it was a few years ago, to maybe something achieving network effect. So, okay. So what you're saying is that it, for Bitcoin, the best res if, if you're a Bitcoin maxi, the best result is no ETH ETF, because you're saying that if funds say that 2% of our allocation goes to crypto, then if the- No, the no, of course not. Come on. It's more money we're talking about. So this is the problem with the crypto guys. They're like $10 billion into the ETF. Who gives a crap about $10 billion? There are hundreds of $700 trillion sitting in the old world. So just think for a second, okay? Just, just use your brain for a second. I'm serious. I'm trying. Okay? $700 trillion. All right. All real estate. Everything that is backed in the old fiat world, that is backed by fiat currency. When you buy real estate, you give someone money, dollars. Okay? So you have that entire world. That entire world in the last 10 years is down 99% against every asset in this new world. Okay? Even Ripple, which people think is a piece of crap or whatever, is up 99% against the NASDAQ. It's up 99%. I, I, it, I, I bought it in 2014. It was one-tenth of one penny. Okay, so it is up, I know, a lot more than those assets. So, you know, you're talking about, oh, is the e e going to be competitive with a Bitcoin? I mean, it's madness, okay? This is the beginning of a new world that's very small, and there is a huge amount of value in the old world that is coming in. OK, so, you know, the crypto guys are just younger. They don't know the numbers or they've never looked at them. It's just it's it's all very positive. ETH is positive for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is positive for ETH. And it's just nonsense. So this, why are we the only people? Why are we the only people that see that Wall Street has fund managers that are young and smart and educated and their job is to find investment yeah. opportunities. Why are we the only guys who, who that get this? That? Who, who said that? I was in the money management business, you know, 25 years. Okay. And there are not that many great fund managers. Okay. The 95% at the bottom all disappear. The top 1% of guys continue to be the top 1% of guys. Let me ask you, so, let, Dan, let me ask you a question. How, how much of your wealth your investable wealth. Let's remove your house and your car and let's talk about your investable wealth. What percentage of your investable wealth sits in crypto at the moment? Over 50%. Where does the other 50% sit? The, uh, the other... No, it's way over 50%. Okay. I, I'm not going to give you the exact number because some people might think it's preposterous. But I don't really have assets in the old world and I haven't for a while. Raul, how, uh, what, what percentage of your investable income, other than the, the fancy houses and, and, and the, the beautiful houses in Cayman, what percentage of your investable income sits in crypto at the moment? 100%. Just show everyone your no shirt. Way. Just show everyone your shirt, Raul. Just, just show everyone the shirt. Been, it's been 100% since, I don't know, 2000, 2020. Been 100%. Yeah, it's it's a lot, but I I'm not investable. I'm talking about like everything, everything. So it's it's a big number. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a lot. We're, we're, we're all in. A big number. It can't, it can't. When you realize that everything you hold in the old world is devaluing at that rate, it's okay against 
whatever crypto. I mean, even things that are a piece of crap. Okay, honestly, uh, cryptocurrencies that you would never own. Those things are all up massively. So yeah. it's not about you, you know, know. This I, is the big. You know, really owned. The other way. This is the biggest macro trade yeah, ever. in all of history. Of all of history. Correct. And we're in the middle of it. There is no yeah. point focusing. You know, that's why, you know, no I, I, we, that's why Dan and I have invested personally. We've built asset management businesses. We've done, you know, every different way of looking at this. This is the biggest trade ever given yeah. in history. Yeah. yeah. It's true. Wow. And, and it's proven to be the case. It's the best performing asset of all time on any time horizon. <laughs> and you think it will continue? Yeah. I mean, like, you, uh, I hear you. I hear you. What are you doing you. here? What do you mean you think it will continue? We're saying it hasn't even started. Here, let me give you something to think about, all right? Because I know we're ending in a few minutes. So the other ETFs that exist, the gold ETF, the oil ETF, the treasury ETF, okay? Let me tell you what happens. When the price goes up a lot, there is a supply response. What do I mean? Gold ETF goes up a lot. Bit, uh, uh, gold miners mine more gold, okay? Oil ETF goes up a lot. What happens? The U.S. invents fracking and there's more supply, okay? The tar sands come on. Remember, oh, they were always talking about Oh, there's all this oil in Canada, but it, the oil's got to get over $40 a barrel for it to be profitable. Well, it did that. Okay. The, even treasury bonds, they go up a, a very high in price and they go to a zero yield, then people issue more bonds. There's more supply. This is the first time ever, and this is where these ETF people, I don't know that they know exactly what they got into. There is no price. Okay. Just listen to this. There is no price that the Bitcoin ETF can go to that will elicit a supply response. Okay. The ETF people, I guess, just weren't thinking about that. So it's a massive accelerant to the upside and it's in the very first inning. So you're asking me, can this go on? This is a joke. All right. It's a joke. I got and it. so yeah, also, I just want to clarify because somebody's going to clip this in three years' time when the market's down 70% and say, these guys are wrong. We're talking over a time horizon, right? The time horizon is this adoption of this technology is ongoing, has been and continues to be and will be the biggest macro trade of all time. And Correct. yes, it comes with volatility. And there will be massive volatility on route. Why don't you just say this? When it gets up to 300,000, it will, of course, then go down 70%. And we will have a correction from 300 to 100. And everyone will panic and say it's all over. And then we'll go from 100. When that happens, okay, when, when, when that happens, when that happens, who cares? When that happens, will the ETF guys start selling? Because we saw a little dip the other day and it did nothing well, for the ETF. At some, point, listen, at some point, there's a price at which people say, okay, Bitcoin's at 300000 That house I always wanted to buy, I can buy it. And that is the only form of selling that will come in. It will come in for people who say, I want to trade my Bitcoin for something in the real world. Okay? That is it. The point is there's no mechanism to increase the supply. That's the whole point. There's always more oil, more gold, more treasury bonds, even more equity. It's hard to issue a lot of equity, but you know, if Nvidia goes up another that hundred, you know, I don't know, 500%, will they issue more stock? Probably. This thing, no matter how high it goes, there is no supply. It will only come from existing holders. So right. that is what the, you know, that is what the ETF is. It's a massive accelerant because the dollars that are available to go into it are bigger than all the dollars that have gone into crypto to date. Okay. That's the difference. I got it. 
Guys, so, yeah. on, on that Absolutely. note, on that note, we have to leave it here for today. I'm completely out of time. Love you guys madly. What a what a way to end the week. I've got a I've got a a, 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 a a fund that's unlocked now and I'm getting paid the money and I promised myself I wouldn't put it back into crypto because I just said I'm irresponsibly long. And you've just convinced yeah, me that irresponsibly long. What else and, are you going to own? Go well, through the go through the maths and say what else am I going to own? Once you well, actually do it, do that charts. So Ro, you're just, out there saying 100% like my number of course is like I don't know 85 90%. <laughs> But I don't think I don't feel like I can say that. DJ and, DJ and Fridays, guys. DJ and Fridays, guys. Because people, this is not being recorded, right? It is. This is no? It's very much is being recorded. This is. It is. Right. All right. No. All right, guys. The reality I'll, is, hopefully, no one listens to the very end here. I thought you shut the recording off. <laughs> Guys, it's been a great show. Love you guys madly. Raul, always good to see you, Dan. Unbelievable to have you both on. What a treat. What a, what a Friday. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, and to you guys, the fam, wow. <laughs> what a way to end the week. What a high. What, what an incredible way to end the week. I will see you guys again on the weekend. Remember, on the weekend, we are on Banter Plus. We're not on Banter. We're on the other channel, which is Banter Plus. Go and subscribe to the other channel, which is over here. It's called Banter Plus. Uh, that is where we're going to be doing all our um, all our uh, broadcasts this uh, over the weekend. See you on the weekend. Until then, trade well, my friends.